the beginning of philosophy isn't philosophy. Rather, it is poetry. Greek poetry, to be specific. While we know the names of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, they did not arise in a vacuum. It is also true that the pre-Socratics existed. Some of you may know the names Heraclitus, Pythagoras, Thales. The pre-Socratics and the Socratics can be assessed for their visions of philosophy, both already contained in the poetic tradition. The poetic tradition concerned itself with the question of man and the cosmos, human nature and cosmogony, to be very specific. These were the issues dealt later by the first philosophers. The pre-Socratics were concerned with the nature of the cosmos, and the Socratics concerned with human nature, though we can say with Plato that he was also concerned with the nature of the cosmos, just like Aristotle would be in his metaphysics. But why does philosophy begin with poetry? Greek poetry deals with the human condition and the cosmos that the human condition inhabits. That is what philosophy is truly about, the human condition and the environment that it finds itself inhabiting, the cosmos. The history of philosophy is the history of human inquiry into our nature and the world around us, from the Greeks and Christians to the moderns and postmoderns. This is the story of the rise of reason with the Greeks, the integration of reason and love with Christianity, the eclipse of reason and the turn to human sentiment and pragmatism in modern science with the moderns, whom we also know as the Enlightenment philosophers. Then comes the demolition of the entire inquiry into reason, love, and pragmatic science by the postmoderns. In this lecture, the first of four dealing with this history, we begin with the Greeks and the rise of reason out of poetry. As already mentioned, poetry deals with the human condition and the cosmos. Any reader of Hesiod Homer or Aeschylus can readily see this. The early Enlightenment Italian humanist and philosopher Giambattista Vico in The New Science articulated the vision that origins and evolution of philosophy that we will follow. The birth of human thinking begins with human imagery and stories, the, imagery, the images and stories found in poetry, which eventually give way to the rise of rationality. Rationality, then, has its beginnings in imagery and stories, what we sometimes call myth a word which in Greek means proclamation or to tell. In other words, myth means story, and all stories try to have some sort of understanding and explanation to them. Thus, the very origins of rationality is embedded in myth, in story. Story is how conceptual thinking begins. For in a story, we have a beginning, a middle, and an end. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We who live in a nominal Christian culture in the West are familiar with those first famous words. But that's not how the Greeks understood their cosmos. The God of reason and love envisioned by Christianity, who created the universe out of love and endowed it with rational understanding, is not the cosmos of Hesiod and the pre-Socratic Greek poets. If we can imaginatively re-articulate Hesiod's beginning in the Theogony, we would say, in the beginning was chaos, and chaos ruled over the heavens and the earth. Chaos is the beginning of everything according to Hesiod. Chaos is the beginning of philosophy, the fundamental questions of philosophy can be reduced to this. How do we make order from chaos? The Greeks, the Christians, the moderns, and the postmoderns will all give us answers. And the answers given is the story of philosophy. 
So let us return to Hesiod's Theogony and hear the origins of the cosmos from him, for this is the beginning of the story of philosophy. At first chaos came to be, but next wide-bosomed earth, the ever-sure foundations of all the deathless ones who hold the peaks of snowy Olympus and dim Tartarus in the depth of the wide-pathed earth, and Eros, love, fairest among the deathless gods, who unnerves the limbs and overcomes the mind and wise counsels of all gods and all men within them. From chaos came forth Erebus and black night, but of night were born Ether and day, whom she conceived and bore from her union in love with the world. As we can hear from Hesiod, Chaos is the beginning of everything, as we have just said. Chaos rules over everything, and out of this chaos came the gods, the titans born of Uranus and Gaia, the most famous of them being Kronos, who will castrate his father for his tyrannical raping of Gaia, Mother Earth, whose castrated phallus will fall into the sea and give birth to Aphrodite and the Olympian deities, the most famous of them being Zeus. Zeus, assuming the leadership of the Olympians, will rally the newly born gods against the Titans. This is the war of the gods known to us as the Titan, as the war of the Titans. Kronos and the Titans are eventually overthrown, and Zeus ascends Mount Olympus as the supreme deity. Hesiod's Theogony, for all of us who have read it, is a violent poem. Chaos necessitates power, and the most powerful are the ones who bring order to the world through the use of violence. Thus, Hesiod sings praises of Zeus, the most powerful of all the deities in the epic. Hesiod and the Muses sing praise to Zeus simply because Zeus is the most powerful of all the gods. The most powerful, the most violent, is worthy of being admired, for out of that power comes the order that brings life to the world. Hesiod's primitive philosophy is this. In the beginning is chaos. Chaos is bad. Chaos is represented most especially by the god Uranus. Chaos is also tyrannical. Chaos is also sexual. Uranus rapes Gaia. Order, in contrast to chaos, is good. Order is the antithesis to chaos. Order is represented by power. Power is manifested most clearly in the god Zeus. Chaos and power, Uranus and Zeus, do battle. Power, Zeus, emerges victorious out of the world born from Uranus and Kronos, the violent gods of the primordials and the titans, from which order is finally brought to the world. This, however, doesn't seem to be a very good world to live in. It's a world of chaos, confusion, sex, lust, violence, war. Readers of Plato will find overtures of Hesiod in Thrasymachus, who in the Republic explains justice as the rule of the strong. Zeus is the strongest of the gods, and thus is worthy of praise in Hesiod, just as if the strongest man who is able to dominate others is worthy of praise in the mind of Thrasymachus. Plato's Republic, therefore, sets an early contrast between the old cosmos of power and chaos and the new cosmos of rationality right from the very beginning. As Socrates tells us, again at the very beginning of the Republic, which is setting the stage for the entire new birth of philosophy. I went down to the Piraeus yesterday with Glaucon, son of Ariston, to pray to the goddess, and at the time and at the same time I wanted to observe how they would put on the festival, since they were now holding it for the first time. Now, in my opinion, the procession 
of the native inhabitants was fine, but the one the Thracians conducted was no less fitting a show. After we had prayed and looked on, we went off toward the town. Catching sight of us from afar, as we were passing homewards, Polymarchus, son of Cephalus, ordered his slave boy to run after us and order us to wait for him. The boy took hold of my cloak from behind and said, Polymarchus orders you to wait. And I turned around and asked him where his master was. He is coming up from behind, he said. Just wait. Of course we'll wait, said Glaucon. And a moment later, Polymarchus came along with Arimantus, Glaucon's brother, and others, apparently from the procession. Polymarchus said, Socrates, I guess you two are hurrying to get away to town. That's not a bad guess, I said. Well, he replied, do you see how many of us there are? Of course. Well, then, he answered, either prove stronger than these men or stay here. Isn't there still one other possibility? I answered him. Are persuading you that you must let us go? Could you really persuade, he said, if we don't listen? Hopefully you listened very carefully to the beginning of the Republic. After Polymarchus sends his slave boy to forcibly hold Socrates against his will, and later, when Polymarchus catches up and he converses with Socrates, he brags that he has more people than Socrates and therefore has more power to force Socrates to do what he wants. Well then, either prove stronger than these men or stay here. Socrates responds, isn't there still one other possibility? Our persuading you that you must let us go? Power versus persuasion. Force versus reason. This is the dialectic that Plato inaugurates for us. This is what Greek philosophy is all about. Reason and persuasion as the basis of the cosmos and not power and violence as was the case with the poets. The rest of the Republic is really a giant dialogue of power advocated by the sophists in contest with rationality articulated by Socrates. And this isn't just the theme of the Republic. This is the theme laid out in every single one of Plato's dialogues. The entire Platonic philosophical tradition casts power violence and chaos on one side, rationality, persuasion, and order on the other. The poets and the sophists are on the side of violent chaos and force. Socrates and the tradition of philosophy is on the side of rationality, persuasion, and order. The cosmos of reason offered up by Plato reaches its climax in the Timaeus. The demiurge doesn't create through brute force or war, as was the case in Hesiod. Rather, the demiurge establishes all things through rational order. Timaeus's long-winded discourses in the dialogue that bears his name has him then discuss mathematics as a necessary manifestation of rational order. Math proves the cosmos to be rationally ordered and rationally understandable. Even though Platonism is sometimes called the philosophy of intelligibility, the intelligible world that we can know from rational thought, the soul which exists within us, Platonism's application isn't inwardly, but outwardly. The idea that some people are taught that Plato and Platonic philosophy is a flight from this world is horribly inaccurate and terribly wrong. People who have no understanding of Platonism and philosophy are guilty of making this assertion. Plato looks outward, yes, to the world of the forms, but in order to understand the world of the forms, we have to understand and observe the nature all around us. 
Plato's forms exist beyond and above the material world, this is true, but we are still contemplating the cosmos and what lies beyond it, the outward nature of our universe. Plato's most famous student, Aristotle, picks up where Plato left off. But rather than look beyond the cosmos for the rational order of all things, Aristotle looks to simply nature itself, the material world, the observable world. Aristotle's most famous gift to philosophy is the idea that we are manifestations of the material world, of material nature, that we grow into nature that we are endowed with. To understand ourselves, we must understand nature because we are nature. As with Plato, though augmented, Aristotle's philosophical empiricism is one of outward contemplation, the outward contemplation of observable nature. Thus, you can see why many scholars today actually assert that Aristotle was a Platonist. Both are observing nature. Both are trying to understand humanity through the observation of nature. The only difference is after observing nature, Plato goes beyond the observable into the world of the intelligible forms. Aristotle simply asserts that nature is all we need to know. This idea of contemplating observable nature to understand ourselves is continued with the Stoics. The cosmos is rationally determined by fixed patterns and movement. The Stoics were cosmic determinists, but they believed we had the power to control our emotions and how we respond to the world of determined movement. We can be more like the cosmos, accepting the movement of nature and being happy as a result, or we can fight against nature and ultimately be miserable. The Stoics, as we can see, share in the Platonic Aristotelian tradition of looking outward at the world in order to better understand ourselves. This is what rational living, philosophy, is all about. The observation of the movement of nature, recognizing we are a part of nature, accepting that we are a part of nature, and then growing into that nature. And this will ultimately produce our happiness. The Greek philosophical tradition of reason, then, is premised on a cosmos of rationality. In order to understand reason, we must observe nature, then live by the nature we observe. Greek rationalism is contemplative. It is the contemplation of outward things, of outward nature. It also takes a negative view of love, of the emotions, which is associated with chaos, and the violence of the poets. Any readers of the Stoics is definitely familiar with the negativity that they placed on the emotions. The emotions are irrational. Following the emotions leads to bad decisions, and to live by one's emotions is to be enslaved to pathos. To be free in Greek philosophy is to live rationally, in conformity with the observable nature of the universe. This tension, however, between reason and love was ultimately unresolved by Greek philosophy. This is the world that Christian philosophy emerged into, a world where reason and love were pitted against each other, and a world where understanding the self was through understanding the outward world. The Christian revolution in philosophy changed all of that. Although it shares with Greek philosophy a priority of the contemplative, its emphasis would turn inward. Christianity would try to reconcile the tension between reason and love by turning away from the outer world that the Greeks observed to the inner world, the world of the human heart. And that is the next story of the history of philosophy.